Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Monday. My name is Shalaya Asad Yazdi. I'm a public health practitioner and an incoming first year osteopathic medical student. I'm passionate about raising awareness of chronic condition prevention, management, and treatments. My mentor, Dr. Jay Shubrick, and I created this webinar series to share wellness tools with our community. Zoom into Wellness began last November, where we discussed what prevention is and how physical activity and nutrition can play a role in our health and well being, especially for preventing the onset or progression of chronic conditions. Based on participants' critical feedback, we have been able to bring our community the topics that are important and can make the biggest impacts in our community's health and wellness. Please type any questions or comments into the Q&A function of the Zoom platform. This webinar is meant to be engaging and would hope to address all questions and comments. Thank you for joining us this evening to learn more about the osteopathic approach to managing diabetes. I would like to introduce Dr. Jay Shubrook and Myrna Daniel, an incoming first year osteopathic medical student who is going to be moderating our discussion today. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Shubrook. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. Well, we have a series of questions this evening and we really look forward to, listen, to learning about your experience with osteopathic medicine. So our first, quest, first question of the evening is, what is osteopathic medicine? Yes, and so I think there are some people on that may know a fair amount. There's other people this may be a new topic, um, but in the United States, there are essentially two schools of, of medicine which provide unlimited licenses. And that is a key distinguishing feature is the unlimited license. Allopathic medicine, or where you get an MD degree, or osteopathic medicine, where you get a DO degree. And while historically they have been uh, incredibly different, um, there are still some important distinguishing features between the two, but they really have become a little bit more aligned. Um, and so, uh, for example, uh, osteopathic medicine might be a little bit more focused on the integration of body and function uh, and the musculoskeletal system and disease, um, a little bit more focus on that the body can take care of itself, uh, that has the ability of self-healing capacity. Um, and uh, this was largely spun out of what was a very different looking allopathic medicine about 150 years ago. Thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Schubert. What inspired you to enter the field and specialize in diabetology? Sure, so those are two separate issues for me. Um, first of all, when I was uh, finishing college, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but when I decided that medicine was gonna be the path I wanted to pursue, um, I was very much into fitness, um, kind of taking care of myself, staying healthy. And um, at least my exposure at the time to allopathic medicine was much more focused on what are the diseases and what are the treatments. And, and again, you know, everyone's exposure might be slightly different. And so I actually chose not to go to medicine and, and actually went to work. And then later, one of my friends uh, went to an osteopathic school and said, I think this is what you were looking for last year. Why don't you take a look at this? And again, uh, you know, again, there's, every school is slightly different, but the, the idea of the osteopathic principles as a framework to how you approach medicine very well matched with me. And that's why I chose osteopathic medicine, osteopathic medicine for myself. Um, now, it, once I went into medical school, I very much wanted to be able to do everything, quite honestly. Um, so I wanted to be able to treat adults and kids. I wanted to be in the hospital and out of the hospital. And so for family medicine, that was the best option for me to provide me the most unlimited choices. Um, but after you know 10 years or so in family medicine, I noticed that there was this growing problem of diabetes. And, and in my mind, nothing is more osteopathic than diabetes where you know, we have um, a disease that we can largely prevent and wholly treat, but we've not done so, so well because we've taken a disease approach. And I really feel like if we took the wellness approach, like I'm going to remove noxious stimulus from my life, such as high fructose corn syrup, or um, you know, um, not being physically active or gaining weight. These are all things that, that if we could address early, 
I could maintain health and prevent disease. And so uh, that made diabetes a very nice match for me. I do like treating diabetes as well, but I'm very much passionate about preventing diabetes. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, we have a few questions that are centered around now the connection between osteopathic principles and how those principles can be used to address the chronic conditions. Sure. So, you know, as you think of osteopathic medicine, we think of the tenets that the body and, and fun body and function are inter interrelated, right? Uh, we talk about uh, that the body has health, self-healing uh, capacities and structure and function are necessarily needed. And you have to use these principles to uh, integrate all treatments. So for me, you know, if somebody is got musculoskeletal problems, they're not gonna move as much. If they're not moving as much, that has all kinds of downstream effects. You're not gonna have circulation as well. You're not gonna get rid of waste products as well. You'd be more prone to gaining weight. Um, nutrition, is a source of health, but it can also be a source of illness. And so if I provide noxious stimulus of unhealthy nutrition to my body, I'm now challenging my body. And so um, for many of the lifestyle related uh, diseases, hypertension, obesity, sleep apnea, diabetes, uh, some cancers, you know, we know that there's a lot that we can do with daily living to prevent and to manage these conditions. And so, for me, this very much fits very well within kind of my framework of health. It's not that I don't use medications. I use them you know, alongside these treatments. And sometimes they're, they're critically important. But I find that um, not forgetting that the person has a, a lot of control uh, and a lot of influence over their health and disease is critically important. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I think that a lot of our uh, webinar series in November had addressed those issues about uh, staying physically active, where to access any free space or free locations for physical activity, and how nutrition plays a role in our health and wellness. So if anyone in the participants would like to access our website, that's where you can find some more specific information about nutrition and physical activity so that we can all address the prevention aspect. Um, and so now I'd like to ask a question about osteopathic approach to diabetes management and diabetes related complications. Sure, so we know that no matter what type of diabetes you have, and there's many types of diabetes, um, that nutrition and physical activity are part of the treatment. And it is important to distinguish the types of diabetes. They're very different from each other. But just let's use type 1 diabetes, which is the least lifestyle involved, because it's an autoimmune disease. But we know that someone has hyperglycemia, they could take a vigorous walk or do some physical activity, and that will allow the sugar to lower. We also know that um, with type 1 diabetes, you, know, you, can, you don't have a nutritional condition you have a condition at which you just have to be kind of cognizant of the carbohydrates that you eat. So as long as you can kind of match your carbohydrates to your insulin, which is what your body used to make, you can manage that. Type two diabetes is very much a lifestyle related condition. And so we would do the same things. We rely, you know, we tell people, you know, when you eat a meal, if you take a good walk after that meal, that's a way to treat diabetes. If you're able to walk regularly, you're going to improve your musculoskeletal function, which is going to improve your cardiovascular health. And so I think that these things are all tied together. And while they may not always be enough, they should always be part of the treatment uh, for type 2 diabetes and type 1. Thank you. And if anyone in our audience has any questions, especially related to the topics that we're discussing now, please feel free to share those comments or questions in the Q&A function. And Dr. Schubert, I'm excited to ask you this. Uh, what is osteopathic manipulative treatment and how can osteopathic manipulative treatment help prevent complications such as diabetes arthropathy? Yes, so um, osteopathic medicine and sometimes is seen as the osteopathic principles, which is the philosophy, and then osteopathic manipulative therapy or treatment, which is the skill set or the techniques. Um, and anyone who is trained and is a, trained in the U.S. at least, 
who, who achieves a doctor of osteopathic medicine degree will have learned both. And so I use the osteopathic principles in just about everything I do uh, when I treat patients. When I am using osteopathic manipulative therapy or OMT, that's isolated for, for, for particular people. So um, absolutely OMT is a series of different musculoskeletal or manual techniques that have been used to really optimize the interrelationship between structure and function. And so while some people think of it just as working, treating the, the musculoskeletal system, we use OMT to treat the respiratory system, the GI system. We actually used it last week for someone that had kind of chronic constipation. We were able to get their bowels moving. You can use this for reducing uh, sympathetic tone when someone's under duress. And so these techniques are not used by everybody, but they were, everybody is trained for them and they are nice and complementary. And for me, that's another tool in my toolbox when I'm managing my patients uh, with diabetes or any other condition. Now, as it relates specifically to diabetes, um, we know, and this is gonna be a, a gross simplification, so please bear with me, that glucose, when you have hyperglycemia, it makes things sticky. When things get sticky, they tighten up a little bit. And we know that many people with diabetes start to develop joint abnormalities before they're even diagnosed with diabetes. So hyperglycemia itself can shorten tendons, can shorten ligaments, and can change joint function. And in fact, in a study that we uh, did in Ohio, we found that the single biggest healthcare expense the year before you were diagnosed with diabetes were musculoskeletal conditions, such as osteoarthritis, frozen shoulder, carpal tunnel, things like that. And so I can sometimes use OMT, not necessarily to change the glucose level, that requires the other things that we talked about, but I could use it to free up and optimize the, the kind of the um, joint function and joint mobility for these patients. And that could be a shoulder, it could be carpal tunnel, it could be a knee, it could be the spine. And there are many forms of arthropathy that are tied to diabetes. And so these are, these are things that will be important for us to utilize when we see that on top of glucose management. Thank you. And why does joint mobility become limited? Yeah, so again, I think that has to do with the um, effects of glycosylation of tissues throughout the body. When you, gly gly excuse me, when you glycosylate a, 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 a material, it often contracts and shortens. And so when you like oscillate tendons and ligaments, they often shorten around the joint that they're, they are holding. And osteopathic manipulative treatment can address this by our hands-on techniques as well? So osteopathic manipulative therapy can absolutely um, address that. It may not solve it, but if I can improve some mobility, then I can improve function, right? And that's, that's the important thing is that if you start to develop arthropathy, it becomes a self-fulfilling cycle that you're less active because you're in pain or you don't have the same mobility. So if I can improve that some, then that would be uh, worthy and the big picture of the treatment. And does osteopathic manipulative therapy play a role in neuropathy? Right, so th this is also a really important question. Thank you. Um, we know that there are many types of neuropathy. So most people think, when they think of diabetes neuropathy, they think of that numbness and tingling that, that they might feel on their feet or their hands and their feet. And we don't know for sure if OMT changes neuropathy. It's an area that we're interested in. Um, but theoretically, if we treat um, the kind of the circulation of the lower extremities, we think that we can increase the, the fluid both in and the fluid out of the legs, which re would reduce this kind of fine motor, um, or excuse me, fine vascular problems that we see with neuropathy or neuropraxia that we see. And so absolutely, I think there's, there's the potential for OMT to treat peripheral neuropathy, but it really needs to be studied. Now, one kind of neuropathy we have studied is diabetes gastroparesis. So diabetes gastroparesis is a neuropathy of the stomach, which results in horrible, horrible nauseousness, bloating, sometimes vomiting, and really a, a really hard time to manage uh, glucose 
uh, for our patients. And seeing both in type one and type two, sometimes more common in type one. And we actually did a study where we showed that a series of OMT treatments really reduced the symptoms of diabetes gastroparesis, allowed the person to eat more often, have less symptoms and less hospitalizations. And we're actively studying that at this time as well. So there are some evolving potential aspects of OMT as it relates to some of the diabetes related complications. Thank you so much for sharing this with us, Dr. Shearbrook. I yeah. was wondering now that we have so much information about osteopathic medicine, its relation with chronic conditions and diabetes, prevention of uh, complications. Well, where can I go to get treated by an osteopathic physician? Sure. So I think that, you know, uh, if you look across the country, there's many, many uh, DOs across the country and they're distributed more in, uh, more in the East than the West, but that's changing. Um, certainly if you went to the American Osteopathics Association, they have a listing of DOs. I think you actually at this point could just Google DO physician in my area and you would, you would come up with that. I, I recently saw, uh, I had a consultation for a patient who was not living in our area, but wanted to see a DO in another state. And we were able to together just do a very quick search. And I was able to give them a list of DOs that were in their state because they were specifically looking for someone that treated an endocrine disease and was a DO. Thank you so much, Dr. Shubrick. We can also provide more information about those sites, about osteopathic medicine and more about Tory University into our chat if you'd like to access that. Now I will open the floor for questions from our audience. Yeah, and I'm gonna do a plug before uh, Myrna gives me the first question. For those that are in Solano County, uh, we really are hopeful that the Student Run Free Clinic is going to open again this fall. And so if people are interested in osteopathic medicine, they would have access to a clinic where their student uh, across the Toro University, not just DO students, but DO students and pharmacy students all working to learn their trades um, and they could have access to that as a free service, as an introduction to osteopathic medicine. So stay tuned. We do think that Student Run Free Clinic is going to open this fall. All right. So we have a lot of great questions in the chat. The first question is, is OMT covered by health insurance providers? So that's a great question. So yes, most providers cover OMT. It does require us as providers to properly document and properly explain why it's necessary. It is a procedure, just like any other procedure. And uh, currently you have to be board certified in osteopathic medicine to be able to get this covered. So, so yes, it is a covered procedure. When I was doing OMT regularly in my family medicine practice, it was something that it was both compensated for on my side, but covered on the patient side. Our next question is, uh, can the joint problems originate as far back as a decade before being diagnosed with diabetes? Boy, that's a really good question. Um, so I think it is important um, to recognize that many people have abnormal glucose metabolism years before they're diagnosed with diabetes. <clears throat> so that shows good insight for whoever asked that question. Um, really it depends on the level of glucose problems and the other things that are going on. So I don't have diabetes, but I have plenty of joint problems, but my joint problems were sports induced. So again, I think we'd have to really look at the person and say, did you have other things that would affect the joints, including excessive weight, right? So, you know, if you're overweight, that also will affect the joints. But in the absence of other contributors, it is possible that you would have that long before but it really depends on the level of glucose abnormalities. Thank you, Dr. Schubert. So our next great question from the participants is someone who's saying, I have osteoarthritis in my right hip and can't take walks or do the activities I used to. The pain with each step is too much. What am I supposed to do other than watch what I eat? Not, I'm not ready for a hip replacement. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for your question. And I appreciate that you've already let us know that you, you've made efforts to try to take care of yourself and pain is the limiting factor. Um, so, you know, for a lot of people that have weight-bearing joints that are painful 
And, and I get the delay for surgery because surgery is a big commitment. And, you know, when you do it, hopefully it's, you only have to do it once. Um, there are other things you could do. So the most common thing I would say is get into a pool. You know, you can get into a pool and that takes the load of your body off of the, the hip, but it does allow you to actually move. And I actually had to use uh, pools for some of my rehab for my, like I had a tore in a, a, a ligament in my knee. And so it was too painful to walk, but I was able to get into a pool and jog in a pool. So there are ways that you can uh, use that. You also can do exercises seated. And so there's many seated exercises and there's, there's exercises you can do laying down. And while you have to be creative about what you do to limit pain, um, there's usually some sort of pathway that you can keep those muscles strong and help your health uh, in addition to watching what you eat. And for what it's worth, doing those exercises is gonna make your hip surgery when you need it all the much more successful because you're gonna have strong muscles around that hip. So we have the next question from our participants is, do the OMT methods differ when treating a patient that has type one diabetes versus type two? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And it really depends on what, what I'm treating. So let's say someone with type one diabetes or type two diabetes had um, carpal tunnel syndrome. I'm treating carpal tunnel, they just happen to have diabetes. So my treatment for the, that condition probably would not differ between type one and type two diabetes. But let's say I was treating someone with um, gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is a neuropathy. So I'm still treating the gastroparesis, but most people with type one are, are going to be thinner than most people with type two. And so the, the involvement of the diaphragm, the involvement of other structures that might be related to the gastroparesis might be different. And so while the core treatment uh, might be identical, the kind of the supplementary treatments um, might be slightly different. And maybe I'm, I'm gonna say this, I, you didn't ask this question, but I think it is important for those that are less familiar with OMT. Um, when I was looking at treatments that were manually focused, and, and again, looking at chiropractic treatments, say versus OMT, um, one thing that I find is very, very different is when I approach a problem, I approach the problem, I do an assessment and I do a treatment and I don't develop my long-term plan until I know how they responded to the first treatment. So it is unlikely that I'll say, you know, you have knee pain, I'm gonna need to see you for six sessions. I don't know that. I actually wanna use the least number of sessions possible. And so I'm gonna treat, reassess, treat, reassess. My experience personally, and again, I don't have expertise in chiropractic medicine, but my experience personally is that there's usually a pathway. Oh, you hurt your neck, you'll need six treatments or 12 treatments over six weeks. So it's more of a um, algorithm as opposed to a treat and evaluate. And, and that's not to say that some chiropractors don't do that, but it is a kind of a key difference. Um, and so a lot of times when you hear someone talk about OMT and I don't give you a, an exact answer, the part of the reason why is because how you do in that first treatment very much will affect what happens next. Um, for example, I was sharing uh, with Shalaya and Myrna before uh, on my current uh, travels, I treated someone yesterday and they got some partial relief, but they actually did not get full relief and I had the luxury of being able to see them again today. And so I actually treated them a second time and they're doing much better, but I didn't know until that first treatment was done. And I often will, um, I really rely on patients to um, be active contributors to their health. So I, if I'm gonna treat someone, I'll probably also send them home with homework. And homework might be stretches or exercises to do as well to reinforce the treatments. So another question we got is, well, the doctor started off by talking about toxic stimuli. In terms of nutrition, for example, high fructose corn syrup, what are those stimuli that we know are toxic and which ones are out there we may not know about as the average consumer? Oh boy, that's a whole topic in and of itself, but it's a really great question. Um, there's not much that's in our common diets today that is not a problem. Uh, we live in a place where most of our foods are processed and processed foods are not foods that are healthy. 
Um, and so I would love for us all to eat like it was 1700. If we ate like it was 1700, where you know we were eating fresh fruits and vegetables that were in season, we were growing our fruits and vegetables, or we were eating things that were indigenous to our area. If you were eating meats, you're eating meats that you, you knew about um, that were not mass produced. That's really optimal. Um, and I, and I want to highlight this that you know diabetes is really common in the United States. It's also very common in other places in the world. But almost every other place in the world, if you move from that country to the United States, your risk of diabetes goes up. And I think at least for me, a big part of that is the poor quality of our nutrition and the fact that we hit, live in a very mechanized society where we don't have to walk to work, we don't have to walk to school. We, we drive and uh, you know, we have things brought to us. We have drive-throughs, right? Who has drive-throughs? I mean, this is, this is an American phenomenon that we share with the world. So, um, so I think that the noxious stimuli are, are inactivity. I, I would say that our air quality is a noxious stimuli, sad to say. Um, Dr. Clearfield led a paper that we did research on showing the relationship between air quality and chronic disease. Uh, not only just respiratory diseases, but other diseases as well. And then our, our poorly, um, our, our, our processed foods are another process, our, our noxious stimuli. I highlighted high fructose corn syrup because it is also something that's uniquely American um, and it's very cheap and it's easy to produce widely, but there really is no nutritional value. And we have some pretty good evidence that at least in the diabetes space, it is harmful. So our next great question is, would OMT help for the hip pain? So if you have osteoarthritis of the hip, odds are very likely that OMT could be helpful for the hip pain, but I want you to have a wider lens. So I am not going to be able to get rid of arthritis in the hip. I think that's very important that we know that from the get-go. That takes years of calcium buildup and wear and tear. But if I can improve the joint motion, of that hip or improve the stability of the knee and the ankle below that hip or the mobility of your back as it, as it attaches to your hip, you could really have better function and less pain. So I do believe that we OMT can be used to reduce pain. I do believe it can be uh, available to reduce um, kind of abnormal mobility as associated with osteoarthritis, but it's not that it's gonna get rid of the osteoarthritis in the hip itself. Our next question is, what does the treatment look like for gastroparesis? Yeah, so the treatment that we use for gastroparesis was a, a series of what we have called indirect techniques. So there are direct techniques that go right to the source and there are indirect te techniques that treat around the source. So these indirect techniques were involving placing hands on the back, looking at balancing the sympathetic and the nerve, parasympathetic sympathetic nerves of the back, trying to balance the diaphragm, which is the main muscle that regulates breathing, and then also looking at the um, relationship between the nerves and the, and the intestines. And so we know that one thing that is kind of a refined OMT treatment is something where we call viscerosomatic somatic reflexes, where we know that the body inter interacts with the, the viscera the organs, and the organs interact with the back. So I don't know if anyone's ever had heartburn and they have heartburn and then the top of their back hurts. And like, what you're not, you're not actually feeling heartburn in your back. You're feeling referred pain from your esophagus to your upper back. Another example might be the gallbladder and the right shoulder blade. And so again, these are, these are referred pains where there's a relationship between the musculoskeletal system and the visceral system. Now, I won't tell you that treating the right shoulder blade is gonna get rid of your gallbladder problem, but I might be able to reduce some of the pain and inflammation by treating the back um, while we go and try to figure out a more definitive treatment for the gallbladder. Right, so we have another exciting question. It asks, can diabetics still consume carbs while maintaining a good lifestyle or do they need to consume medicine for a long time? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I would say, I assume that we're talking about type 2 diabetes. And if we're talking about type 2 diabetes, um, 
Absolutely. Well, not, let's doesn't matter. Let's let's talk about type two and then we'll expand. Absolutely, carbohydrates can be part of a healthy diet. Carbohydrates can include fruits, vegetables. There's carbs in some beans. There's carbs in some grains. As much as possible, you want to eat unrefined carbohydrates. So you never should be drinking your calories. And anytime you have a carbohydrate, if it goes to the original source, that's optimal. So absolutely, you can do that. Now, most people, including myself, probably eat more carbs than we need to eat. And so if we eat an excessive amount of carbs, that can contribute uh, to glycemic problems if you're at risk. Um, now, anytime someone can manage their type 2 diabetes with lifestyle alone, we're thrilled. I'm, in fact, I'd be even more thrilled if we could prevent you from having it in the first place. But many people, probably 85 to 90 percent, find that by the time they get diabetes, and this is uh, to the earlier question, usually it takes 10 years or more to develop diabetes type 2, there's enough things wrong that medication is going to be part of your treatment. Um, and we do get people off medications. I would say that that doesn't mean that you're cured. It just means that you've been able to regulate the glucose and put it in remission if your sugars are normal off medications. Um, but medication is not a failure. You know, I think our failure is preventing it in the first place. And again, most people don't even know that they have prediabetes, so I can't blame them for not knowing. Um, but medicines often are a needed part of that. And the more that you can do with lifestyle, often the less we have to do with medication. A follow-up question to that was when we say we don't we when we say don't drink calories, can smoothies be detrimental to our health, even if we are cognizant of measuring sugar level in the fresh fruit smoothie? Right. So every statement has a, a caveat. Um, so I think a, a, a fresh fruit smoothie sounds delicious to me right now. Uh, so I, I think that there can be really amazing, tasty smoothies. Um, if you can make your smoothie with whole fruit and with vegetables, that's optimal. Now, given a choice, eating that whole fruit is better than the smoothie, but you certainly could have a healthy smoothie and you just wanna make sure you're not adding sweeteners to your smoothies, which is what a lot of people do, right? They add juices, um, and I wouldn't recommend adding juices to your smoothie if you can avoid it. Certainly um, thinking about making sure that you um, use the fresh fruit to, to flavor your smoothie or fresh vegetables. I believe that was the last question we have from our participants. Thank you, Dr. Schubert. Yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, I would say for those that are on, if you're interested in osteopathic medicine, you should definitely take a look. Um, you know, for me, this was a, an excellent career path and um, it fits very well with my personal interest in diabetes. And um, it has worked very well in family medicine as well. Um, I have uh, had wonderful experience with MD and DO physicians. And so I don't think that there's one that's better than another. But I do think, um, particularly for chronic disease, osteopathic medicine very well aligns, the principles of osteopathic medicine very well aligns with the management and prevention of, of chronic disease. So thanks for coming. Marina, we have one more question. Yes. So we have one more question that came in. It asks, how would a DO help a burdened pancreas from diabetes? Yes, that's a really tricky question. So there are many things that can cause pancreatic problems. Uh, so uh, pancreatic problems can be from inflammation. It can be from blocked ducts. It can be from cancer. It can be from alcohol. So um, when we think about the pancreas, pancreas does make insulin and does make glucagon, but in type two diabetes, it may not be the central organ. So if someone has pancreatitis, which is maybe not exactly what the person asked, I may use OMT to reduce the pain associated with pancreatitis, to reduce the sympathetic response, but it's really gonna take time for that pancreas to heal. I might be able to improve the drainage in the abdomen to get things, to get rid of the waste products quicker, but these are all things that are going to help heal and help recovery, but it's not gonna be the only part of recovery. 
And so for pancreatitis, that's what I would do. For diabetes, I think of it as a, a much more system-wide approach. And so uh, I don't just think of the pancreas. And in fact, the studies looked at people with diabetes and their most common somatic dysfunctions are not at the pancreas uh, because there are many other organs involved, at least in type 2 diabetes. Oh, one more question. So no someone, someone's asking, is diet or exercise more important when working to prevent or maintain illnesses such as arthritis and diabetes and overall health? Yeah, so I don't think that one can be more important than the other. And I think there's also other contributors to that. So I don't have any personal or family history of diabetes. I'm one of the few, I think. So if I were trying to think what would contribute to my overall health, it might be the activity would be run, have a stronger role for my maintenance of health than nutrition per se, because I don't have any metabolic diseases in my family. If you have a family history of metabolic disease, nutritional components are very, very important. And so there'll be different gradations, but I would say both are important. It really is based upon what runs through your family. Uh, in terms of the level of each, but both are important. And you want to work with what's what you're able to do. So for those that don't know me, I want to dunk a basketball. I still want to dunk a basketball and I haven't done it yet. So I'm going to, if I'm someday going to dunk a basketball, I'm going to have to work on my, my fast twitch fibers so I can eventually jump high enough to do so. So I have to kind of work within my means and take time. I think too often we are too aggressive you know, the weekend warrior that goes out and like does four hours of exercise after not doing exercise for three months, those are people that really, you know, are well-intended but are gonna have more injuries. So I think that uh, just take your time, take one step at a time and celebrate small successes on your path to wellness. Okay, so another question that came up uh, is, in the, is there a simple rule that some can follow, for example, 30 minutes of walking after eating? Is that in terms of managing glucose? It doesn't specify. Okay. Um, I do believe uh, there are some rules I have in life. I believe that motion is life. If you have ever seen a stagnant pond, things grow in the pond and it doesn't end well, right? So you need to keep moving. And whatever that movement is, it, you know what it is, find a movement that you like, but keep it as part of your life. I also believe you should never skimp on your belly or your feet. Um, so I think if you're gonna spend money anywhere, make sure you wear really good high quality shoes so you can keep moving and put really good things into your stomach because that's the fuel that fuels your body. Um, when you are trying to maximize your metabolism, and I think that's where that comment that I said earlier about taking walks after meals, if you're someone who has a family history of diabetes and is more likely to store fuel rather than burn fuel, taking a walk after each meal, a minimum of 15 minutes, and make sure that you get your heart rate up enough that you either break a light sweat or you get a little bit breathy, um, can really help you to take that food and, and not store it as fuel, but burn it right away. And so that's the goal of that walk after meals. It's also good because I don't know about you, but my lunch that's supposed to last an hour lasts like a six, like six minutes. So I eat way faster than I should, and then I sit around. So if I'm gonna eat faster than I should, which is probably what I shouldn't do in the first place, I should eat more slowly, digest and stop eating when I'm full. But if, if, if I do that, then going for a good walk afterwards, really allows that fuel to be utilized right away. And your body will store all that it needs. We just don't want it to store too much. I believe that was the last, last question. Thank you so much, uh, Myrna, for being such an incredible moderator this evening and relaying all of our participants' questions to Dr. Shubrick, and thank you, Dr. Shubrick, for being here this evening and teaching us about the osteopathic approach to managing diabetes. Thank you again, Myrna and Dr. Shubrick and all of our audience members for being here this evening. 